It's an honour to be with you uh, this morning because uh, these problems that we're discussing are universal. The universal desire for us to control our leaders is not peculiar to the people of this country or the people of Europe. It's been an issue that we've been struggling with in Nigeria for a very long time. And because we are much further down the road than the road that you've been taking on, uh, we perhaps in a privileged position to spot the trends, to ring the alarm bells so that you can uh, detect what lies ahead a little more clearly. So I've been asked this morning to give evidence in this trial and as is the tradition of the courts of England, I promise to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth as I see it. I start with a question. What does it take to be a democracy today? I figured that a, a Western audience like this would know the answer, especially as you've been practicing democracy for how long? Especially also, now that Western governments are beginning to have converted democracy into an export item to be exported to the less civilized parts of the world. I thought I had found the answer in a recent opinion piece in the Times, written by one Tony Brenton, who was a former British ambassador to Moscow. The article was captioned, Quotes, there is a simple way to promote democracy. Set up an international group that only truly democratic states can belong to. I was naturally curious as to the test that he was going to apply in determining which are the truly democratic states and distinguishing them from the pseudo-democracies. His answer was simple as simple as his method. This is what he said. If you hold an election judged by international experts to be free and fair, you are a democracy. And if not, you're not. Well, it can't get easier than that, can it? And so applying this uh, very simple test, states like Zimbabwe, Venezuela, and Iran, we get the straightforward answers that they're not democracies. Why? Because the international community has said their elections were not free and fair. But ladies and gentlemen, nowhere has the farcical nature of this test been more clearly demonstrated than the events that are taking place in Afghanistan at the moment where so much blood, so much sweat, and so many tears have been invested towards a free and fair election. You might say that even the idea of elections in such a setting at the present must be an oxymoron. The reality, of course, is that thanks to the globalizer's fixation with controlling the world, Elections in places of strategic interest, like Afghanistan, are spelt with the S at the beginning. Selection. First, you identify the winner in your own strategic interests. Then you organize something that can pass off as an election in order to legitimize the chosen one. We know it because this is what happens in elections in Nigeria all the time. The winner is chosen, and then the parade is organized.
President Karzai had been selected as the winner before the contest began, on the basis that he was the one that the coalition forces had determined could best hold the country together in their strategic interests. The real electorates, thus having voted, all that was needed now was a parade that could be passed off as free enough and fair enough to cloak him with legitimacy. Legitimacy in the eyes of the international community, however illegitimate he might in fact be in the eyes of his own people. Elections that are free and fair enough is all that is needed for Afghanistan to be hailed a democracy. Unfortunately, of course, the rhetoric on Karzai was a long way off from the reality. And the only way to reconcile the two was to rig the elections. Now, having been seen, to, uh, seen uh, screaming from the rafters about the elections in Zimbabwe, Venezuela, and Iran, the international community could not afford for Karzai to win outright. What they needed was for him to win, but the margin of victory should be small enough to allow for a second round of elections. Because if you have two rounds of elections, then you're twice as democratic. <laughs> when Karzai overdid the rigging, <laughs> what happened? Rather than invalidate the entire exercise as an abuse of the concept of democracy, they brought the scissors out to trim his vote tally down to 49.67%, just 0.33% below the threshold for an outright win. Thus it was that democracy in Afghanistan was reduced to a farcical exercise in post-election arithmetic. It might be said that this is how they do it over there, because they are not developed. But I ask you, is it really different over here? The people of Ireland were asked to vote in a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. The choice was simple. Yes or no? They said no, very emphatically. In a democracy, that should have been the end of the matter, shouldn't it? But it wasn't. Those marking the exam said that they had given the wrong answer. <laughs> and they were to be made to resit the exam. And at the resit, having done the revision very thoroughly, read the exam paper this time very carefully, and reflected most soberly on the implications of giving the same answer as before. The people of Ireland this time said, yes, please, by a resounding two-thirds majority to boot. Of course, it needed to be more than a marginal victory in order to choke off calls for a rerun of the whole exercise, now that it was one all. Now, of course, that could never happen in Britain here, could it? The British people would never allow themselves to be dictated to, would they? The British people know their minds, and they know that their yes will always be yes, and their no will always be no. Don't they? Besides, as Ambassador Brenton put it, the UK has, quote, such impeccable democratic qualifications. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's testimony to the truth of these statements that the British government decided against putting the British people to the trouble of saying yes or no. <laughs> Whether the issue was going to be war against Afghanistan or war against Iraq or handing over the sovereignty of this country to Brussels, as the Nike advert goes, the policy was, just do it. So you see, beneath all the pomp and paraphernalia, 
As between Afghanistan, Ireland and Britain, Britain is in fact the least democratic country. 